Hey guys, it's Dave TCG coming to another video. Uh, this is gonna be the how to play Rebecca. So you guys have been asking for um, a guide on what to do with the mulligan, the matchups, how to play, uh, when to activate Rebecca's ability, when not to activate Rebecca's ability, when to counter, not to counter, all these questions, guys. So this is the video to try to answer everything. Of course, if I do miss something or I didn't clearly explain something, you can always comment below, message me on Discord or IG, and I'll be glad to hopefully miss you guys as soon as I see it. This is going to be a long video, so let's get to it. Um, here, I just won last tournament, so this is going to be a different Rebecca build. I'm just showing you guys that it is still winning tournament, usually undefeated on the local scene. And I will put my new build. On the deck list, um, just a few changes you might see here. Uh, it still runs very well. So let's go ahead and start the video. The first thing first, you know, there could be a lot of repeated things that I've been saying from these past videos that will put in this video, so I do apologize for that. And hopefully there's new tips and tricks that you guys can learn as well. Uh, so one of the repeat things that I know I've mentioned multiple times is you want to go second. So obviously by doing that in most Locals and big tournaments, you do a dice roll. If you win a dice roll, choose to go second. The good thing about Rebecca is you can go first or second. Uh, it doesn't, you know, you have your first dawn plays with Rebecca's ability into a key ruse, into a Sabo, into a Luffy. So it doesn't really matter. It doesn't hurt the Rebecca players if you go first or second. That's a good thing about uh, this leader. But it's more efficient if you go second because then not only you can play your cards, you can always activate her effect, which is gonna help you build your trash and your hand. So that's the reason we wanna go second. Uh, but like I said, if you do go first, it's not the end of the world. Not like old black leaders where you had to go second, if not you lose. Um, another thing is with Rebecca, as you guys know, she cannot attack. So the advantage that we have with her is to use her ability to build trash in hand. The goal is that your hand is, should always be at seven cards. If it goes more, it's because you're taking life early. If it goes less, you're over countering too much. Um, and of course there's variables in this game that it's gonna go either way that you have too much cards in hand or you have too little cards in hand. Uh, playing optimally, meaning that you're gonna be at seven cards you're gonna counter out to go to five cards and then you're gonna keep your life because you wanna st stay a healthy life as long as you can. But also it's a sweet spot where you're not losing too much hand advantage as well. So you have to keep your hand size, hopefully at five, keep your life up as much as you can so you can get to late game very optimally so then you can win the game. Because the goal of the game with Rebecca is to go late game. She is the late game queen. I think she's one of the best late game leaders. Just the fact that you can put your deck how you want it to be with stuff like Luffy, Mancherry, and Lushi, right? All right, so since we got that out of the way, let's see if I can show you some examples. Let's start with what shot I mulligan, right? So I'm gonna give you guys a little Obviously, there could be other variables, but this is the main stuff I look for depending on what I'm playing against. You know, this is what I call my starting hand. Um, so obviously, not this is not the starting hand that you want, but these are the pieces that I'm looking for when depending on who I'm playing with. So, you know, a 2k counter, you always want to do that when you're playing against Red Purple Luffy. You want to have some 2k counters. Tendra Kuzan, you've heard me with against Yellow. Uh, it's always a human life against white beard only. 3000 world against like purple Luffy's. Uh, or even red purple is still very good. And then Rebecca Coliseum for people that want to go wide. So let's go ahead and explain things uh, very more in depth. So let's start with the one drop Rebecca and the Coliseum. So the one drop Rebecca and the Coliseum, why the matchups I like to look for these cards are purple Luffy, red purple, so including Luffy, Law, and Kid, purple Luffy, Sakazuki, Sabo, Zoro, Red Green Law, 
this is going to be your bread and butter for all those decks, mainly because of Colosseum. Um, this is where I even thought of bumping up the Colosseum to three because how important this card is against those matchups in a real competitive matchup. Um, because the Luffy so is going to keep you in the game for those matchups. If you don't have the Colosseum and the Luffy for those matchups, then you're pretty much losing that game, right? You can still pull it out, um, but it's just the advantage. It feels like it's on the other player. But when you have this already established before the 7-drop Luffy comes out, so when does the 7-drop Luffy come out, it's on your fourth turn, right? Because if you go first, that'll be your seventh on turn. If you go second, it'll be on your eighth on turn. The good thing about going second also is a little bit more forgiving because you have another turn to see if you can find the Colosseum because you only need seven Don to play the uh, to play the Luffy, so you have an extra Don to play the Colosseum. It's just better if you already have the Colosseum established before the Luffy comes out on the eighth Don turn because then you can put a Don under him, making him an 8k swing, and most bodies are 6k now when you play against the purple Luffy especially. And even Sakazuki against Delushi. So swinging 8k is the magic number. Um, that's why you want to have the costume out before that four dawn turn as well. So why is Rebecca the backup? What happens is if you do not see Coliseum, but you do see Col uh, the one drop Rebecca, sometimes I won't mulligan. Because the Rebecca, if everything goes as planned and you're countering how you need to, which I'll show you a quick example, you're gonna see, including the five cards that you start out in your hand, you're gonna see around 18 cards, you know, plus or minus two, right? So 16 to 20 um, in a good day, because if you get multiples of these girls, then you're, you're gonna go to that 20 mark. So that means you have a high, high chance to see the one drop Coliseum. In the deck, we run two right now. Uh, so seeing 20 cards, on, before, and again, this is before your four dawn turns. So we're talking about in three turns, seeing 20 cards to hopefully see the one drop Coliseum and not including if you actually take some life. Okay, so just to show you a quick example how that means. So again, first five cards, if Coliseum is not, I did not see the Coliseum, but I saw the one drop Rebecca and I have four other cards, I would not mull again. Because the problem is that you mulligan when you see the one drop Rebecca and you're trying to shoot for the Coliseum and you mulligan and you don't see these two, you can still obviously activate Rebecca's ability, but you're not seeing 20 cards. You're seeing maybe, you know, six, seven, 12. You're probably seeing like around 11 cards, right? On average, plus or minus two versus 20, right? Or, you know, 18 to 20. So that's, that's the reason though that I keep when I see the Wonder of Rebecca. So say this is my five cards I'm looking at. Imagine this is Coliseum. There you go. I'm keeping this hand, even though it's kind of ugly. Um, I do have a 2k counter. I do have the Wonder of Rebecca. Say I'm playing against uh, Purple Luffy or Sakazuki. It doesn't really matter. Now, another thing is, remember this one drop Coliseum is going to go over here. So it's not going to be in the deck. Um, so I might actually see it. I do have a pile here for late game, but just ignore that. So go ahead and get the five drop life. And this is just for an example. And say you win the dice roll, so you go second. You draw a card. And the first thing you always want to do, like I always tell you guys, activate Rebecca's ability, top two. One, two, and I saw Coliseum. Well, there you go, we won the game. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Just like that. So um, even if we didn't see Coliseum, let me just show you guys what I meant. That's a little awkward here. All right, so go ahead and play the one drop Rebecca. Top three, one, two, three. And we see the Luffy, so we'll grab the Luffy. Now we are ready with the Coliseum and Luffy's on the four dawn turn. You know, uh, it goes to my opponent's turn. Now, let's say, now, most of the time, most of the time, they should swing only either 6K or 5K on your second Don, depending on what's going on. So if they swing 6K, you're blocking Bartolomeo. If they swing 5K, I'm either going to use an extra Rebecca or I'm going to use my Arlumbus, depending on what I think I need. 
most of the time on the tool, always have a cost reducer in hand. So if he's putting 5K, for example, I'll block with Rebecca. If it's against Luffy, they're gonna swing 7K. But on their early turn, they like to establish either like a Zoro or something to try to gain Dawn. So most of the time it will be a 6K swing. So let's just assume they swing with 6K, you're gonna use a 2K counter, keeping you at five life. And then your opponent passes the turn. Here, you're gonna see when you draw, that you're gonna be in more than six cards in hand, you're at seven, but the good thing with the one drop Coliseum, you can actually play the one drop Coliseum here. And it, let's just assume it wasn't the one drop Coliseum because we're still looking for it, right? So you don't have a one drop to play. So you will actually play the toy soldier here. The toy soldier will put you at six cards in hand and then you're still able to activate your back ability. Now there is gonna be exception to this rule um, because as you see here, I have Bastardo. So playing Bastardo here, you will not be able to activate Rebecca's ability. So then now we're going down the path of not seeing cards. So even though I told you guys that's what you need to do, but there's always exceptions, guys. If at his three dawn turn, he's playing something like the Zoro to recurve dawn, or he's playing um, an aggressive three drop, that's a three drop 5k attacker that he's gonna just try to build some aggression and you're not there yet, right? Because at the following turn, like how do you answer two bodies with Rebecca when you cannot swing with Rebecca, right? So here I will actually play Bastardo if he has uh, an aggressive board where I, f I need to make him relax because I don't want to use, I can just over counter for sure. But then now I'm going back to not having a nice hand to get me to that late game, right? I already have the Luffy, I know I have the one drop stage card, so I'm sitting pretty, I just gotta get it there. And once I get this there, then the tempo goes to my turn, right? So if he has a big body on his second dawn turn, he will most likely just swing 5k, put three dawn to play a, a three five, then I'll have to do Bastardo, right? There's no reason not to. Yes, I miss a turn to activate Rebecca's ability. Yes, I miss seeing two cards, but to relieve the aggression is more important. If you're playing against Purple Luffy, they're gonna play a four drop 6K, right, on their three dawn turn because they activate Luffy's ability. They're swinging 6K, you're gonna use a 2K counter, and then they're gonna summon a four 6K. I'm using Bastardo. Very important, okay guys? It relieves the pressure. Then they have no card in the field. When it goes back to your turn, you're gonna be on six dawn turn. So then you can actually do a Rebecca's ability. You can even play the four drop Rebecca, put a blocker out, play another uh, Bartholomew. So now they have, you have two cards on the board and two blockers necessary. So let's just do that. Let's go ahead and skip a turn of Rebecca. Let's assume you're playing against Purple Luffy. He's gonna swing with 6K. You're gonna use a 2K counter. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, he, yeah, he swings with 6k, you use a 2k counter instead of, well, I never use a 2k counter, I apologize. So you use the 2k counter because he swung with Luffy's ability and he played the 4 drop 6k. Let's go ahead and activate Bastardo, pop that, and pass turn. You see that? So now the aggression is less. They have no cards in the field. They are going to their 6 down turn. They're going to go ahead and swing 7k. Now what happens when they swing 7k? Then you can over counter here. With two cards, you're gonna drop to four cards in hand. But then you actually can you activate Rebecca's ability next turn? Yes, you can. You can activate Rebecca's ability and play the four drop, and you're gonna stay at five life. By all means, take these two cards, right? Then he plays a big body. Say we're, I mean, you know, they play a, I don't know, a queen or the the kid that's gonna recur and don. That sucks for us, but there's something we can do on that turn. And then he passes turn. So then I draw for turn. 10 drop Kuzan. It's okay in this matchup, especially if you're at five life and it's beautiful. I go to six Don. And I mean, I'm sorry I don't have the other cards. That's, you know, if I did this online, maybe it would have been easier to show you guys. Uh, but hopefully you guys are just keeping up with my imagination here. Point being, your opponent has a body. We're trying to search for Coliseum. We do have the Coliseum though. So what we do here, always have to remember this ability because we're at one, two, three, four, five cards in hand. We'd be definitely gonna grab that one drop Rebecca, trash the Luffy. 
we're gonna go ahead and play most likely the Rebecca here, right? Four drop Rebecca, go down to one card left. We're gonna go ahead and grab anything we need. So here, we know we're gonna go into Luffy because we have, we did get the Colosseum, right? So grabbing another Luffy here is not bad. If you wanna be defensive, grabbing a 2K is not bad. It all depends on, I'm sorry, not this 2K because Rebecca can't grab that, sorry. Or this, these are the options that I'm thinking of playing this make-believe setup. Because he's gonna swing with 6K, maybe 7K, he's maybe gonna, you know, this will really pressure. I do have a blocker already established. So, but then I have Luffy already ready to go next turn, swing twice and then play another Luffy. So in reality, I'll most likely grab the Luffy just because I know in the purple matchup, Luffy is the key to win. And then second ability is to play Rebecca, right? Because you can play a three drop or less from hand and then this gives you a plus one as well. If I did not have this Rebecca and these were the options and this was something else, then maybe I'll grab the Bartolomeo because I'll actually play the Bartolomeo with Rebecca's second ability, knowing they have two blockers. He's gonna probably swing here for one of them and then swing at life with the other one. I'll block two and then my life is still at five and I can play Luffy. You see what I'm saying? But because the variable changed because I drew into this one drop Rebecca, I'm gonna grab the Luffy Play this one drop Rebecca, reveal top three, two, three. And then here, most likely, because of how my hand is, it looks like the 10 drop is gonna be possible in this game, right? There's no reason 10 drop does not come out. So the 10 drop is gonna remove, but then what do I have else to remove? I have the Luffy to remove, but then do I go defensive with the 2K? Mm, I have a blocker out there, I have another blocker. Do I go defensive with Sabo? or do I grab the Bastardo? And here, to be honest, I will probably would have grabbed the 2K counter because I'm getting no counters in hand. I already have a pretty good clear here. I have a Rebecca if I to grab anything and I have a Kuzan for late game. So I'll probably grab the 2K here, to be honest. And then with one down open, I activate the stage card, completing the achievement, and then I pass turn. So now this is at the one, two, three, four, five, on my sixth on turn, I completely grabbed the Coliseum, even though I did grab it early. I did miss using her effect once, so I am not seeing two cards I'm supposed to, but it's because I had to, to keep my advantage in this make-believe setup. But let's see how many cards I saw in total using the one drop Rebecca. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 cards. So it would have been 20 cards to back to Rebecca's ability on my second turn, but I did not. And I still saw 18 cards. And out of those 18 cards, I did get that one drop Coliseum, getting me ready on my eighth on turn to play Luffy, if that makes sense. So this is why the one drop Rebecca is the backup. If you do see her against these matchups, I will not mulligan that um, just because you are going to see the cards that you need eventually. Uh, you have, you know, seeing 18 cards are going to hopefully grab you things you need and you're still at five life. And depending if you did take a life early, it would have been a five drop Sabo giving you 19 cards that you saw. Okay, so hopefully I kind of you know, went from a scenario of showing you why you need the one drop Rebecca into showing you some game strat against Purple Luffy and what I think about the, because what happens when the more you play these matchups, they play, it runs very similar. There is variables, I get that, but there's gonna be in the early game to get to the late game variables. The early game is more predictable, if that makes sense. So you kind of predict what's the worst case scenario for you as a Rebecca player. And if you can answer the worst case scenario when he doesn't have it, then it becomes easier against you, if that makes sense. That just goes back to game theory, you know, beating the, the best possibility your opponent can play. If that's not gonna hurt you, then the ones that are not the best possibility should be fine in theory, right? So anyways, so let's go ahead, go back to the main topic and I'll go back into this purple Luffy matchup when I get into matchups.
but this is why the Coliseum and the One Drop Rebecca is the way to go um, for any matchup. That was against Purple Luffy, but that was the whole point because you want to grab this Coliseum before you grab this Luffy. If you do not get the Coliseum out of seeing those 18 to 20 cards, then Luffy is not a priority to grab because then the Luffy, when you, the if you guys don't know, I should actually just mention this, why is the one drop Coliseum is my target against those matchups that want to play a lot of cards out. It's because when the Luffy comes out, when you have the Coliseum in play, let me just go ahead and take these cards out, then the Luffy becomes a rusher. And with his effect is if you have seven cards in the trash, you're able to restand them when he swung and swings again. Well, in Purple Luffy and uh, Sakazuki especially, you just want to clear their board. I don't care about having a lot of trash. The reason I want a lot of trash is so that when I swing with Luffy, I can restand swing again to for Purple Luffy to relieve pressure and against uh, Sakazuki is the Luffy's gonna get answered regardless so might as well get rid of their hand or two bodies so that's the reason the Luffy becomes very pivotal because he's one of your cards that can come out swinging right away yes the Coliseum will let your Sabo your Kyrusas come out swinging as well but it's not as much pressure as the Luffy and that's the reason the Luffy is very pivotal in these matchups but only if you have the Coliseum, because if you do not have the Coliseum, then if you bring out Luffy on your four down turn, you play Luffy, you stare at them, and you say pass turn. The problem is against Purple Luffy, depending on the Dawn curve, if they play nine drop Kaido, there goes your, your tempo, and you probably just took a big hit right there because your, your Luffy's getting pop, he's swinging with you 10K, now your life is getting compromised. And now you're you're going downhill. While against Sakazuki, you play the Luffy. He's gonna bottom deck that. And best case scenario for him, if he can bottom deck while using Hound Blaze to give a brand new or something a, a power boost to swing 7k at your life plus bottom decking your Luffy, and you didn't do anything with the Luffy. Now you lose a huge tempo. So do not play Luffy if you do not have this Coliseum already established because of tempo wise that uh, you can play him to stare at your opponent but like i said if he gets answered optimally then you're pretty much losing the game this is why this is so important before you play this because when you play him you have to swing twice right away don't swing and restand and then pass turn or swing and don't restand them yes i know you want to have a lot of cards in the trash so that your first starters can pop six drops or less but this is not the matchup. The matchup in Purple Luffy is to survive, clear board, and they're gonna run out of steam. It's like a, you know, alternate Zoro that you can just clear their board, they're gonna run out of steam, and then that's when you come back. And against, same thing with Sakazuki, in a sense, they're gonna run out of combos. So you just gotta clear the board. They're, if they don't run the Tender of Kaido on you on curve because you stay at the five life mark, then they're gonna run out of steam as well, and then that's when you take over, okay? And the Luffy's gonna help you do that. So that's the whole point for the Morgan face to see this card against those matchups. So then this Luffy becomes uh, your saving grace against those matchups. Okay, I think I kinda hopefully explained that very well for you guys, probably repeating myself multiple times, but it's okay. It's just more emphasis. So let's go back to my Mulligan hands that I like to look at. So this is the, we already talked about those two, so that's completed. And what else was I looking for my Mulligan hand? Where's my, oh, you know what? I actually have a Mulligan hand right here. Those are just cards I saw. <laughs> so there we go. So I just have to add this here and the rest go bye-bye. All right, bear with me guys. Because we're, we're gonna do, hopefully these examples are helping you guys out because this is what I'm gonna do for all these cards here. <laughs> all right, so we answered this, why I like the mulligan for this. Let's go ahead for an easy one to digest. Um, it's always of human life. So it's always of human life is another card I like to mulligan for against Whitebeard. 
own it's a white beer exclusive if you play against white beer you want to see this card so my first five i don't care if it's the perfect hand it's the most beautiful hand if i don't see this i'm mulliganing trying to look for this because if you see this as long as you play average does you know just optimal plays nothing crazy and then you play this on curve or the following turn then you should just be white beer there's nothing white beer can do it feels bad they're gonna be so mad that you're running this and then you win the game okay so that's the reason against white beer i'm all in this this is the reason this is here is against white beer but now that i'm seeing more you know we've been seeing the european nationals we've been seeing other tournaments and I don't see any too many white beer representation. You know, most people move towards red, purple, Luffy. So this is gonna go back to maybe taking out. I just assume that white beer will still be prevalent in these big tournaments. But you know, it's mainly if you're not playing Sakazuki and now or purple Luffy, then then you're not. I guess you're not doing very well unless you're playing Rebecca. But that's just because people don't know the sauce. But that's a whole different subject. Um, but yeah, so this card might come out again. Again, this was only for White Beard, assuming that in big tournaments White Beard was gonna be relevant. Um, so let's just go ahead and tell you why this was here. But I might take this out again to help with the main matchups that you guys see, which is Sakazuki and now um, Purple Luffy and Red Purple Luffy. It looks like are the main ones that you're gonna see. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but oh, and category, of course, but category now, we wait, you know what to do, so that doesn't matter. So, yeah, so I might just put this for another 10 drop or or whatever. We'll, we'll have to look into the deck list again, but yeah, this might just go bye bye again. Anyways, let's go talk about whites here. So, white beard. So, you're playing with white beard, Mulligan, see this, destroys them. How do you destroy them? So, in the beginning of the matches, um, I'm gonna go into very deep detail. Uh, white beard players, you just have to answer the board. So you really want to see your bastardos and your three swords early. Uh, three swords you don't use unless you have to, because you want to use that for the Marco, um, and you want to use bastardos. So what happens is when they want to go second, if you go second, you're beating their curve. So I like to, you know, play the one drop Rebecca, activate her ability, blah blah blah. On my fourth dawn turn, I would use Bastardo right away to clear whatever they play. That's usually the Atmos or whatever they use. If they're swinging, you know, with 7k, I will over counter, try to get my 2k's in hand. And just keep gearing board, keep playing block by playing, you know, your Rebecca combo into Hina into something that removes. And sometimes I'll play the three drop Hina into Kiru's on your sixth on turn. Um, but this will again alter you from active Rebecca's ability, but on your sixth on turn you're able to actually play Hina minus a five drop to a to a one, play Kiru's, pop that one, and then you have to cost see him out you swing with this guy uh, to something else that's rested. Whatever you need to do to slow them down, clear the board so then when the late game comes, you hopefully still at three or two life. You can play, there's two ways to go around this. You either have the 10 drop Kuzan out. If you have the 10 drop Kuzan out established, then you play It's Always a Human Life. You bottom deck all their blockers. If you have the 10 drop out, you're bottom decking their Rush Luffy, their Rush um, Ace. You're bottom decking the Marcos, everything they have on the board other than the nine drop white beard. If you have this guy on your 10 Don, when you already have the Kuzan out, you can play this guy, activate this on the nine drop white beard, and then play this, and their white beard is also being bottom deck. And then they go down to five cards in hand. Obviously you're gonna pass turn, I mean, depending on the, on the state of the board, if they have nothing and they only have five cards in hand, and this guy can't attack, I'm swinging 10K to their face, making sure they get rid of if they have you know donna getting rid of a radical being plus a 2k or a, a radical being a 1k or a guard point and a 2k if they play the white beard that turn then maybe just a guard point but then they have to answer this kuzan because now they have only five cards in hand because then when they draw they go to five if they use two cards they go to four 
and then you should hopefully just win from there. There's really no reason you do not win from there unless you're at no life as well. Then he's just gonna swing 16 and pray, right? Uh, so that's one strategy. The second strategy, it's the same thing, except that this guy won't really clear the board. It would just clear um, their blockers. But if they, if you clear their little blockers out and you already have this guy established, then you can put two down on the Luffy and swing 9k twice, um, hopefully making them use two cards in hand. And then they're going to have to clear this Luffy again because then next turn you can just restand and swing and then clear whatever blocker they play out. Um, and then you should win from there because you just took a huge advantage against the white beard. So this is the other backup. So one of these guys should be established hopefully by then. Uh, Luffy, I don't see why it wouldn't. And then you just, like I said, clear their board, clear their hand, and then just win the game. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, but that's what you will do against the white beard. That's why that's the mulligan phase for the white beard player. And remember, if you have no white beards in your locals, just please take this out. It's definitely still a good card without against white beard because you can combo stuff like this. But like I said, this is more you can play another card instead that's gonna help you in your harder matchups. Uh, if there's no white beard player, okay. All right, next mulligan face. We already talked about these three. So these are gone. So now we're down to two cards. Let's go ahead and talk about this 3000 world that you guys are probably thinking why that's here. So 3000 worlds, um, like I said, this is the main thing, but it's just sometimes when I see this card, I don't want to mulligan. And it's because it's such a good card to control the field, especially against Sakazuki. Now I will prioritize these two I, um, still in most matchups, but sometimes when I see 3000 worlds, it just, I won't mulligan it and then I'll just pray that I draw into these two. Just because the 3000 world and the Bastardo gives you such good control that you're able to get to a late game still very effectively uh, and hoping that you will see the Coliseum. So this is like a buffer, but it is a card that sometimes when I do look at it, when I'm like, man, if they play Magellan, I can answer the Magellans real quickly against Purple Luffy. If they play against Bor if I play against Borsalino, I can answer Borsalino that it just it makes the matchups a little bit easier, but it's not as effective as like what you really need to do. It's just like I said, sometimes when I do see this, because of what it does, I do not mulligan if my other cards seem good, like I have two K counters. I have the Wonder of Rebecca sometimes, or you know, it's just it's hard to 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 verify. It's it's not a good card for me to tell you. Like if you see this, don't mulligan. again. It's just I'm just letting you know that when I do see this, I do personally don't have mulligan sometimes, depending on the other four cards. This this is so reliant on the other four cards. These are just easier to tell you if you don't see this, but you see this, don't mulligan. If you don't see need none of these two against the matchups I told you about, definitely more again. If you don't see this against White Beard, definitely more again. If you don't see this against Yellow, definitely more again. This you will mulligan sometimes, you sometimes won't, well, depending on the other four cards you you have with this to then tell you, you know, yourself that you're gonna do well this game. And that's why I have this on here. It's again I'm not giving you good good explanation. It's just it, it this just pairs well with the other four cards that you might not mull again. And um, it's just because it, it helps you out a lot in, in a lot of matchups. So that's why that's here. Sorry for this explanation. Maybe I should just take this out. <laughs> uh, just because I can't really explain well, but hopefully you guys know what I mean when, depending on the pairs with this card, it uh, you won't mull again. And the matchups again are basically the same matchups as these two. Um, but like I said, for, for now, just focus on these two, ignore this, but maybe you guys will see what I'm talking about of why you won't want to do with this. And it'll also help you with your ratios. As you can see here, three of these cards you cannot search for. So when you do see these cards in your hand, it helps you with the ratios of not whiffing with the one drop of Becca or the, rep, or the, your leader's ability. All right, let's go ahead and move to one of the bigger subjects. It's the 10-drop Kuzan. I've, 
you know, said this multiple times. This is how you win against yellow. I've said what you can substitute against it. I mean, uh, substitute if you don't have this uh, amazing card in your build. But just letting you know that even if you sub it, you know, the how you deem the issue or the main two that I recommend if you don't have it, it just won't do as well the 10 drop can do because the fact that the yellow player cannot answer this card. The Isho and the Hayudin can be answered with Katakuri technically uh, messing up your whole game plan. So that's another big thing that the yellow player does not have anything to interact with this guy as long as he's not sideways, right? Um, so this is why uh, the 10 drop is just very much needed in the yellow matchup. Um, it's going to help you win games, but then how do you get there? So let me explain. So in the mulligan phase against yellow, you will mulligan until you see the 10 drop. I don't care what other cards you have in your hand. Once you have them in your hand, your objective is to get to the 10 drop safely. Um, so, you know, you will always go second uh, with the 10 drop. And there's no point to showing you guys that. You always go second with the 10 drop. And the whole game plan is, again, the same thing is to get to like game very, very safe. Let me just make this the same. Um, because once you get to a late game and you have, um, you know, you're gonna go to zero life against yellow. That's, that's not the issue. The point is you do not wanna go to zero life until you have this guy established. So, because you don't wanna be a zero life play this guy and then he looks at you like okay i'm gonna swing 15k at life you know gg you want to play him safely meaning that you're at least at two life and your opponent only has maximum two swings okay and if he does have three swings it's because he's playing the nl rusher and then you're able to still counter one of their 7k swings if that makes sense because uh, I don't see them, I mean, yeah, or maximum 8k. If you can count that, then that's still safe for you. But then the problem is then you need to play the Kuzan while clearing two boards. So it's basically, you know, you'll get to a point that you need to be able to play this guy safely. And then that when you pass your turn, they can't end the game. And then you clear their board and build blockers. And then from there, you take off. Okay. So, meaning that if you're down to zero life and you can't play this, you lo you lost your um, your game advantage of beating yellow. Because beating yellow and what yellow players understand is they need to beat you before this guy comes out and they need to make you a zero life before this guy comes out, okay? Um, and your goal is clear their board, be a healthy life, and then when this guy comes out, you defend, and then you clear, and then you win, okay? Uh, so normally what I like to do is against the yellow player is have a lot of Bastardos, a lot of 2Ks. So no matter what they're playing, I'm just clearing board. Clearing board, building blockers, using Rebecca, Hina, Q's combo, Rebecca, Kobe combo, block with the Rebecca. Keep doing stuff and to keep interacting, using your seven drop loop with Coliseum, clear their board, using your garb, using your three swords, doing the Rebecca things to control your opponent's board, defending yourself appropriately in life, not over countering too much to a point because it's okay to take some early life. When they play Hocus Pocus or Seven Drop, Big Mom, you're giving them the life, make them at 100 life. It doesn't matter if you're still gonna win the game. Don't use the effect to, to put your life um, and now it's a little bit harder because they can, if they hit good curves and they can play the four drop uh, card that lets them play the dog, they go a little wide on you and if you're not ready for it. You can sometimes, if you can't clear at least one of them safely and have a blocker out or, you know, if you're not ready for that, it can sometimes throw you off guard. But if you are then ready for it, then you have a good hand as well. Then you're able to, you know, clear both of them, or sometimes one with a good defense, then you're still sitting okay. While the cat carries are a much easier matchup because they don't um, play multiple cards with that advantage. So that's why the Sky Island's a little bit harder because again, you wanna get in, gain to your objective. Now, of course, even though you have that big advantage 
of beating yellow because of this guy. If you don't see him or you don't interact with your opponent effectively and you don't protect yourself effectively, you can still lose the yellow matchup, you know. But once you are able to see your 10 drop clues on, remember, even if you mulligan and don't see him, you still have six, technically five chances, uh, not including, you know, taking life, to see him before your curve on the 10 dot, okay? So there's still multiple uh, times to see him. You just need to see it before your 10 dot turn. And even on your 10 dot turn, if it's more beneficial to play a Rebecca blocker into a Hina into clearing two guys out and making your opponent has no board out and then play the 10 drop the following turn, technically on your 12 down turn, meaning your sixth turn instead of your five turn, then that's that's effectively, you know, you don't blindly be a 10 down and play the Guzon out and then, you know, pass turn. If there's something more um, efficient, more beneficial, you play that first and then you wait for the 10 drop. And then once you get all those variables out, once you know, understand how to clear the board, defend yourself effectively against yellow, and then you, you, you realize that, okay, this is when I play the 10 drop, and then you go for the strategy of the 10 drop, then you should not lose against yellow anymore as long as you're able to keep that interaction, which is gonna hopefully be every, every game, right? Of course, there is those rare chances that for some reason you see no 2Ks, you see no uh, blockers, you see no 10 drops, then yeah, there's nothing much you can do. Um, can you still win without the 10 drop as long as you're doing the, the foundation, the foundation, interacting with your opponent's board, clearing the board, protecting your life as much as you can when, when it's feasible, then yes, you can still win against um, the yellow player using cards like Orlumbus instead. Um, and um, Rebecca Hina combo over and over again. It just less efficient, you're gonna feel like you're using more cards, it's gonna feel more combo heavy, but it's definitely possible. That's why the Rebecca is definitely good. You can, if you don't see them, you can still win, but you cannot win against yellow if you don't do the foundation of interacting with your opponent's board. So learning that is more important first. Once you're able to get to the late game safely, you play the 10 drop Kuzan, and then I'm gonna show you the strategy from there. So once you have the 10 drop Kuzan now, the whole point is to have to when you play the 10 drop, I normally pop a Gidatsu usually, or either a home or the four drop 6k that becomes a 6k. And then my following turns, the next goal is to basically play Rebecca and Sabo, right? Because Sabo needs to be played every turn to keep you from losing into a Thunderbolt and then having two blockers out and keep clearing with the Kuzan, right? So normally, depending on the board state, if he swings with something, you know, I'm countering out, I'm gonna swing over it with the Kuzan, knowing that there's a chance the Kuzan can be targeted now, but then I follow up with a Rebecca blocker into either a Batala male blocker, right? Using Rebecca's ability, and then I play the Sabo. Now I know I can protect the Kuzan. If they go for life, I can protect my life and they can't Thunderbolt it. There are multiple life, so their uh, card that rests a four drop or less cannot be played because that can only be played when they're at one life. So that's not gonna be a big deal here. And they can't Yamatomi or get that to it because Sabo's gonna protect you too. So this is gonna be a guarantee, you know, and then we're using Rebecca's ability. I'm playing the three drop Bartolomeo, which I don't think I have in my hand here. Nope, I did not. So I'm gonna have to search for this guy. So yeah, and then I have the Bartolomeo usually out. And then, so no matter what, if he attacks here, I'm letting that go. If he attacks here, I'm blocking with Rebecca. And so on and so forth. So then, again, remember I should be at 201 life, hopefully around here. So then when these two get answered, I have this, this restands. I'm clearing the board again, but hopefully the best way to do it is that you will bring out either a Garp and use a Garp's ability to clear that person. Or if you have the Coliseum out, seven drop Luffy will be the better play with the Coliseum already out, swinging at two things, clearing board, and then passing turn. 
And the good thing about having Luffy out, if he plays that now, the rush right now, then <clears throat> um, and now can be answered right away without him using Anel's ability. So that's why the Luffy is the better play here. Clear two boards out. It passes on his turn. You know, you have to your best ability. Keep some count. You know, you're focusing on grabbing counters and more Sabos. If he clears the Sabo with Thunderbolt because you didn't play that turn, he swings at your life or go down to zero life. And then he passes turn. Now this is where you start winning because depending on your hand and depending on how the game went, you should be at low cards left in the deck, but hopefully you have another Sabo in hand uh, by then because you're never playing a Sabo until you get to this late game. So then you play another Sabo. You know, if you have another Rebecca, then it's the same concept because you already have a cost reductor and a popper. Then your goal is to probably play Rebecca, grab the Bartolomeo back in trash, play the Bartolomeo by Rebecca's ability, and then play the Sabo. And then once you have this board state, this is where you win. So again, even though the 10 drop came out, you still had to get to this board state. You know, it could have been Garp or Luffy, hopefully Luffy more. It could have been, um, instead of playing the Rebecca, you just play Bar hard play the Bartolomeo into a Sabo many variables but you're getting into this point and then you know now they can't on the bolt that they're gonna attack you want to use depending on your hand if you're able to recur it especially with the luffy and depending on your deck size if your deck size is finally at like less than 10 cards in the deck then i'm blocking with sabos just because I can bottom deck the Sabo and then using my Rebecca's ability or playing another Sabo in hand, I'm able to draw to this card to, you know, always look at four cards to the point that the Sabos I put back in the bottom of the deck, I'm going to see again. Because at this point, once you're at one or zero life, the goal is once you have this established, your next goal now is to keep playing Sabo every turn. So Thunderbolt is out of question. There's nothing they can do. They can't Yamato, they can't Gitatsu. Not there's really nothing. I mean, Gitatsu can't do anything because you're gonna be at no no cards in, in your life. But Yamato can't go ahead and just start popping anything they need to pop for them to win the game. Because Sabo's effect, right? So that's the name of the game. Once you get to this point, your your goal is gonna from here on out continue to play Sabo every turn as much as possible. If you have three blockers out at this point, then it doesn't really matter if you play Sabo, you can miss a Sabo turn um, just because with three blockers, the chance of them having three Thunderbolts at hand are very low. I mean, if you take this risk and they do happen to have three Thunderbolts and they go for because that will leave them with um, a 9k swing, then hopefully you have a 10k counter in hand at this point. Uh, because you're going to keep recurring 2Ks as well. But, you know, the chances are very low. But I'm just saying, if you have three blockers, you could miss a Sabo turn if you need to. Uh, that is a backup that you can do if you so happen don't draw your your recurrent Sabos. But if not, uh, you know, two blockers are the name of the game, and one of them needs to be an on-play Sabo, not just a Sabo standing here. It has to be an on-play Sabo, so then it, your blockers don't get popped. And then these guards are clearing your opponent's board. And the goal is here is to prioritize um, clearing your opponent's board and blocking with Sabo. So then when it comes back to your turn, so let me show you an example real quick. So once you're here, it casts your opponent's turn. Your opponent, uh, depending on who you're playing against, but they just say it now, they have like, I'd say they have five cards in hand on average. So they're gonna try to go a little bit wide. They're gonna play that bold guy into Ohm, into, I don't know, Gitatsu, because that's right there, nine down. They're gonna swing with 6K. If they're swinging with 6K, they're just respecting your life. So then you're gonna go ahead and just use a 2K counter and keep your three blockers, right? On your following turn, your goal is to clear that board. So if they have five cards in hand, they went down to, let's say best case scenario, they went down to um, three cards because when they activate the bold guy, they were able to grab a dog, play the dog for free, and then they play Gatatsu, so they went from five to three in hand. So they don't have too many counter power, right? Gatatsu's are 6K, you're at 10 Don. Uh, depending on your hand, if you sh 
have a bastardo in hand, you know, or a three swords, you're gonna go ahead and activate your leader's ability if you're able to. If you're at seven dawn, then I mean seven cards in hand, then I'll activate bastardo, clear the Gitatsu, because it's a five cost six. That puts you at six card. You will then activate Rebecca's ability, it puts you at five dawn left. And then I'll just put all five down on the Luffy and clear both guys uh, by swinging, re-standing, and then swinging. The re-stand is also very important because when you swing with 12k at the old man, you re-stand and you swing 12k at the dog, you're going to re-stand and by putting seven cards in trash, you're going to always put Sabo, the one drop Rebecca, so you can search into a Sabo, into a 2k Bartolomeo, into a 2k um toy soldier into another sabo into a luffy maybe and into an, a board clear like bastardo or gum gum king kong what something like that is what you're going to keep recurring you're going to always have one sabo in the trash so you can always grab it with rebecca or man cherry if you get if you get those cards um and then the other three sabos are going to keep recycling the bottom of your deck and then you pass turn why i'm not swinging at life well, if you swing a life, if you did not play Sabo this turn, a Thunderbolt trigger can mess you up, one. Two, if they play a body out, they can um, anytime clear your, your blockers and if you're not ready to play another Sabo, then it can also mess you up. So I, that's the whole point here is you have control. Take it so you're going to win the game. So clear the board. That's the name of the game. Pass turn. And when it goes to your opponent's turn, they're down to three cards in hand because they're going to draw now. I would say they draw into four cards in hand. Then they can either try to go wide again, but most of the time they can't. They will just play one card this time to say, oh, seven drop and now rusher. And they're going to swing 8K and 10. Uh, they can swing 7K and 8K. You know, when they swing with 8K, you're going to end up block with the Bartolomeo. And then if they swing with 7k, you can always do a 6 and a 2k counter. And now you still have two blockers. And then they pass turn. Luffy already attacked twice, so you can't activate Luffy again. But now you have a slot open that you can play a Garp. You have two blockers, so you're still pretty safe to not play another blocker. But if you feel like they have something, then what you can do is you can play a Bartolomeo. You can uh, play another Rebecca. If you do play Nara Rebecca, then your goal is to let's see if I have another Rebecca in hand here. Thought I did. I guess not. Um, your goal is to, you know, play the Nara Rebecca, grab. Let's just say right here. Say you play Nara Rebecca, grab a Sabo, so you have a Sabo in hand ready to go. You still have six Don. So what I will do is I'll put all six Don or five Don into. The Kuzan and swing over the Nell, and now can the seven drop in Nell. The Nell cannot use the Nell's ability because Luffy is out. They have no board, and then you can't give Rebecca's ability if you have less than uh, six cards. If you don't, if you have over, you're, you don't have to do anything, and then you pass turn. And then the next turn, this Luffy's gonna be stand. So now they're just playing with four cards in hand, they're gonna draw another card, you know, and they're gonna play one card out, and they're gonna swing again. You block with Rebecca. You already have a Sabo in hand, so you're good to go. So then when you pass turn, now your Luffy restands. You draw a card, and then you clear that guy that came out, you know? And right here, you have an open open four board. If you have Garp, you play Garp, and then you clear that guy. Then now you're able to attack life, and then no matter what comes out, you can play, you can attack it with Luffy. Now, you have five downs still open. So if, if a Thunderbolt, say you attack life here, um, and your opponent, you already clear the board and they play Thunderbolt, you know, they can Thunderbolt here, but most likely they're gonna be greedy and Thunderbolt here. Well then, remember you have five down open, so then you play your Sabo, right? So then you play Sabo, you draw two, discard two, now they can't do nothing against you the following turn, and then you pass turn again. Why don't you attack with Luffy? Well, what if you attack again and it's another trigger and they're able to bring out, I don't know, the five drop, the 5,000 power 2K counter uh, fat boy there? Well, then, you know, you can re-stand the Luffy and then swing over it, but 
you have no Dom, and if they counter out, then yes, you have two blockers, but why take that risk? What if they play it now? What if you have no cards in hand and they play it now and then swing seven, seven, and six? You know, there, there's a chance you can lose, so why take that risk? So I do not take that risk. You're already going to win the game, so you just pass turn here. Your opponent can't do nothing next turn. He's playing with four cards in hand every turn. He tries to go wide this time. He plays two cards in hand. He's down to two cards left. He swings. You block with Rebecca. He passes turn, and then you draw. And then here, you want to hopefully play a Sabo. If you don't have a Sabo, you want to then man Sherry. You know, you play man Sherry, you grab the Sabo. You're down to eight Dawn active. You play Sabo over Sabo, <laughs> just so you can activate the ability here. You draw two, discard two, hopefully grab another Sabo here. You know, this is restand, my bad. And then you play Garp to kill one, and then you put the other three down here, you kill the other one, and then you pass turn. You don't even have to restand them. You will restand the Luffy if you don't have, um, if you're running out of cards in deck, because at this point, you should be at like no cards in deck, so then you activate Luffy, not because you're gonna swing again, but because so you can put the Sabo, the Rebecca, the 2k counters back in the bottom of your deck. So then when it goes back to your turn, you can activate Rebecca's ability. You know, you draw two, discard two. I'm sorry, you, you draw, you reveal two, you grab one, and then always prioritize Sabo or 2k. And then you pass turn. And then now your opponent's at three cards in hand. And then again, they play one card. They can't do nothing. They swing at Sabo. Uh, well, the swing at man share your life, you block with Sabo, and then he passes the turn. Say worst case scenario, he plays an eight drop category. And then here he should pick the man share because man share is going to keep grabbing you a Sabo. So, he, you know, he gets rid of your man share, but now you have an extra life. Now it doesn't matter because then when it goes back to your turn, the guard can clear the category. You have this, you have this, so then you draw for turn. You know, if you have the four drop Rebecca, you grab a Sabo. If not, you play a Sabo. Um, and then you, you know, you clear with Garp, you swing a life with 10k, you know, if it's Thunderbolt again, somehow, you know, Sabo goes bye-bye. And then you either play two blockers from hand with Rebecca and uh, Bartolomeo, because Rebecca can grab you Bartolomeo, you don't activate her effect to play Bartolomeo, you just play something else. Um, and then you just play the Bartolomeo, but of course, if you did play the Rebecca, you're just going to grab Sabo. You know, because then you're still at 10 Dawn. So this goes down to 6 Dawn. You play Sabo. You're at 1 Dawn left. You activate Rebecca's ability. And then you pass turn. And then when you pass turn, they're, they're still playing with two cards. No cards in the field. And then they shoot either scoop because they know there's nothing they can do. This is keep recurring. This is keeps recurring because of this guy. If the man share did not get answered by Katty Curry, that you don't even need this. All you have to do is keep blocking with Sabo and every turn activate a man cherry and then play the Sabo. Every turn. There's nothing they can do. This is a lock against the yellow player. Um, and that's it. Hopefully, I think I kind of went into a lot of details here. Um, a lot of make-believe stuff, but it's just because it always ends this way. Of course, these cards are variable, like I mentioned, but once you have the 10-drop, you basically just need anything to remove the board and a Sabo. The rest is to keep recurring the Sabo, playing the Sabo, keep bringing back the Sabo, and then you keep clearing board with Bastardos, Three Swords, Garb, Luffy, etc., etc. And then if you do have the Man Cherry, then there's gonna be a point that you just play the Man Cherry, activate Man Cherry, and keep playing Sabo, and then it just keeps recurring from there. And then you will never deck out because you have the Luffy. And then you never, you always will have a Sabo because of Man Cherry. And then if the Man Cherry finally gets answered, you should have all the Sabos in your hand. And then you just slowly win the game because you're slowly attacking one card at a time to the point that if they Thunderbolt or if they play a trigger, you're answering either at one because Thunderbolt can't do anything on trigger when Sabo's on play. All right. Whew. A lot of talking there. Hopefully that all made sense. Hopefully you're able to follow me. Hopefully you can rewind and follow me there. But all this example, if you need to see a live example, I have three or two, I think it was three matches against Yellow, against Katakuri and Anel, 
with Rebecca in the channel so you guys can see this live. You guys can see that this is not make believe. And even OPO4, this what I was doing against yellow as well. Without and then OPO5 be more efficient because you have these cards that weren't available to you in OPO4. But in OPO4, this was possible. In OPO5, it's just much, much easier. Um, and then if you need to see that live example, like I was saying, you guys can see it in the channel. Uh, where to the point that you guys can see a play by play other than me just talking and giving you guys with imaginations. All right, and so that's it. So that's the whole point of 10 drop. That's the whole point, how to be yellow. Like I said, and that was a little bit harder because they can play two cards at once, but it's still very doable. And yeah, guys, so you're beating the two, the two best decks in the format, quote unquote, and now on Sakazuki with the Rebecca, using these mulligan strats, using the cards I'm telling you guys to focus, and hopefully you guys will have a better matchup with this newfound knowledge, if you guys didn't already know about it. I guess probably you guys already knew about what to mulligan, what to look for uh, with the Rebecca. All right, what's next? Red, purple, Luffy. Uh, so red, purple, Luffy, even though I've mentioned that the cards you wanna grab is the, you know, Coliseum, so then you can play the Luffy. That is the truth. But the difference is with Red Purple Luffy, you don't want to play, you want to have a lot of cards in your trash, but you don't want to play the late game strat with Red Purple Luffy because they have Diablo Jambes. So if they didn't have Diablo Jambes, the late game strat with Red Purple Luffy, very easy you will win the game. But because they, I've seen multiple run two to three Diablo Jambes, that's what's gonna beat you because you're gonna gain advantage to the point that you feel like you're winning and then they're just gonna Diablo Jambes swing 16 when you have no life. Because like I said, most of these games in the late game, you're gonna have no life. But the thing is with the Sabos and the Rebeccas, you're able to take the no life into late game and then still win. But with Red Purple Luffy, you can't do that because of Diablo Jambe. With Zoro, uh, this I guess should be another thing that I should tell you guys with Zoro and uh, any red deck, I like to stay at two to one life. That's my zero life against those decks, including Red Purple Luffy. So your goal is with Red Purple Luffy is at all times, the lowest you wanna go is two life. If possible, one life is still manageable, but two life, it's the goal, hopefully. And you want to have Luffy out with 15 cards in the trash. The whole goal is because they don't play blockers and they don't have too much 2k counters. When you have the opening, you want to basically just do Luffy and King Kong gun and swing before um, 19k twice. In the beginning, they're going to let you give, take a life from them. So your goal is to, which I never say, but your goal is to basically get them down to two life. So in the beginning, by having a Kiros or Hino, whatever, just swing 6k one time, then they're going to most likely just take it. And they're going to be at two life. Once they're at two life, you don't attack again. Your goal is to hopefully have this Luffy up. If you have another guy out, even better. But get Luffy out with King Kong gone, clear their blockers, but there should not have any uh, from what most of those I've seen, and then just go for 19k twice. The chances are they should not be prepared. They, they try, they have like four Don open, then they're ready for you with two rad beams. But you'll still go for it because they don't have that much counter power, guys. They're so focused on bringing out their 9-drop Whitebeards, their 10-drop Luffy's, Diablo Jambes, that their Rad Beams and their uh, Guard Points should hopefully not take effect on you. And then you just swing twice with King Kong Gun and Luffy. It's the goal. The backup is, of course, I don't know if you guys noticed, but it is going to be on the deck list in the description is I add a new card called Elisabello. Um, so I like Elisabello for the red, purple Luffy because if I don't have the King Kong gun, he is my backup. What I do is I, if I'm gonna go for game, I just activate his effect. And again, the whole point of this is you need to have at least 
15 cards in the trash with King Kong going with 14 because this count as your 15. Very doable as you saw from the a one drop Rebecca um, because again the goal is to grab one drop Rebecca Coliseum. Um, if you have the one drop Rebecca, you're gonna definitely get to the 14 card trash on your third turn, right? And then as a bellow, you want to have 20 cards in trash. That one you have to have 20, not 19. You have to have 20, but this is your backup if you don't see King Kong going because we only run one, so we have two cards. And when it's a burial, uh, most red purple Luffy's don't clear, but you can play the Sabello into a Sabo and make sure that the Sabello does not get answered by the red purple Luffy. Um, so when that happens, you can just activate the Sabello uh swing put one down swing 16 and then if you have the sabo then you swing uh for game for 15. so you can do a 16 15 you can do a 15 16 um and then hopefully that clears as well right so that's usually the strat of course with the luffy if you have a kiru's out or another sabo out then you can always just do like i said double and then swing with a six but that's usually what I do against Red Purple Luffy. You play the game, you interact the board, you try to stay at two life, bring out Luffy, grab King Kong Gun. If you see King Kong Gun with I can go back to the belt, I keep because you only run one. If you see the Sabeo, um, I try to keep him as well. And then play him concurrently with the Sabo to try and end the game. Um, once you have the Luffy out or the Sabeo, they understand what you're trying to do, so they'll try to end the game that turn as well. So you just keep in mind of that. And yeah, that's usually what I do against Red Purple Luffy. It's, again, like I mentioned multiple times, Red Purple Luffy and Purple Luffy are your hardest matchups. Uh, Red Purple Luffy, it's harder, not be it's mainly because of the Diablo Jambe. That's the only reason that that is hard against you, is because of that card. If Diablo Jambe was not in that deck, then you wouldn't have to play this aggressively against it. Uh, but that is the name of the game is you try to kill them before they kill you with the Abu Jambe by you doing a double attack King Kong gun or Elisa Bayo into all your Don Asabo. All right, hopefully that made sense there. Um, all right, so that should be all the mulligan face talk into combo talk that I did not plan for, but we went ahead and did that anyways. So the next will be, um, I kind of already were talking about it, so let's just go ahead and talk about it, is the matchups. So against Yellow, uh, we already talked about is, you know, going second, playing the Kuzan when you can, effectively keep interacting with the board and then build that board state that said, and you should have a winning matchup against them, statistically speaking, because by you and your deck is made to interact, your deck is made to have cards in hand, and then playing a 10 drop Kuzon is most likely gonna happen, especially if you run three of the deck. Um, but doesn't mean you're gonna win 100% of the time because there is chances that you cannot interact with the board or you do not see the 10 drop on curve or you didn't have enough counter power to stay in healthy life to play the 10 drop. So that, that does happen, not saying that it doesn't, it's just statistically speaking, it should happen less than in your most of your yellow matchups. Against Sakazuki, uh, most of the deck lists are running without the 10 drop Kaido. Uh, so one of the questions I had, I, I guess I should talk about, is that against the Sakazuki player, let me show you my, since I do have my backup Sakazuki deck, Uh, against a Sakazuki player, uh, they don't run the Tendrop Kaido as much, right? They run mostly the Hina Kuzon package because that looks like that's the most consistent uh, version of the Sakazuki decklist. Uh, but there is the peel off version, there's sometimes peel off in both, there's sometimes the Tendrop Kaido into the Hina Kuzon version. That's I kind of try to separate them in my head. Um, but say they do have the Tendrop Kaido, the one the question was like, I'm beating the Sakazuki, but when the 10-drop Kaido comes out, that's it. I lose the game. Well, first, let me say that if you're doing very well and you're losing just for the 10-drop Kaido, then you should win against most Sakazuki players then, right? Because first, the 10-drop Kaido and into Sakazuki is very inconsistent, right? 
the chances of them seeing the 10-drop Kaido, they have to do the same thing as what we do with the 10-drop Kuzan and the Rebecca, is that they mulligan just to see the 10-drop Kaido, or um, they don't discard it with the brand new. Because with brand news, and they're playing multiple brand news, if they're playing the Sakasuki deck right, there's a high chance that they're gonna discard the one ten drop Kuzan, uh, the ten drop Kaido, and they only run one in the deck, then that's it, there goes your problem, and then you should win. If they run two in the deck, then by them discarding one, the chances of them seeing the, the one of ten drop Kaido since the one got discarded is very low. Then if they do see it, then and you're losing to it, it's most likely because they're losing the 10 drop Kaido very early on curve, one will say. So how does the 10 drop Kaido work? Well, the 10 drop Kaido depends on your life, right? And they have to go second. So if you're at three life and they go second and at the ten, on the fifth turn, they play the 10 drop Kaido, then yes, I agree with you. There's really nothing you can do. It's GG, unfortunate, but you losing that way, it's very, very low. Because most of the games, you should not be at three life against Sakazuki as a Rebecca player early that early on. If the Ten Drop Kato comes out when you're at two, one, or three life, and it's late game, then it shouldn't matter. Because you should be able to answer the Ten Drop Kato right away, plus build advantage by playing a Rebecca into something else to clear into a Rebecca's effect gating hand, and then now you're just fighting against a Sakazuki with four cards more, in, with three cards technically more in hand, and then you just rinse and repeat, and then you will beat them because they can't play the 10 drop Kaido again, if that makes sense. Because if you're winning before the 10 drop Kaido comes out, and it's late game, that you can basically, you have a, your 10 drop Kuzan out, then you can just Bastardo, three swords, you can basically play Rebecca, into a Hina, into a Kiru's because the Tender of uh, Kuzan's out. Or you can have Orlumbus already out into a Bastardo, into a one drop Rebecca, into Rebecca's effect to build more advantage. So then they have no board, and they, yes, they have cards in hand, but then what they're gonna do, they're gonna use their cards to combo out. And then, but you're the late game queen, so you're able to, you have your cards again, so then you just clear their board out. And then you're back to where you were, just with a little bit starting with less life, that the Sakazuki will run out of hand again, and they can't just grab the 10 drop from the trash and play it again, so then you win. If that makes sense. And that's late game 10 drop, right? Late game 10 drop. Kaido should not alter you. That's that if you see that in the late game, then you should win. If that makes sense. I'm hoping I'm hoping that makes it's making sense because if the 10 drop Kaido gets answered, not only you gain advantage because you're able to not only clear the 10 drop Kaido, you're able to build board. And then now you're just playing against a Sakazuki from, from turn one, basically, but with a board advantage. And then you just re rinse and repeat, and then you win the game. Now, the dangerous part about this is that you could go into time, but it depends on the turn and match. Just don't give Sakazuki player time. They should be playing uh, less than one minute per turn, and you're playing less than one minute per turn once you get to that level, right? So, yes, you're normally in locals, and I like to always give my opponent time. I want them to play effectively, but in a real turn match, they should not be taking more than a minute per turn, especially in the earlier dons. And if you know if they are and you're in a real tournament, by rushing them, they're gonna make a mistake, and then Sakazuki make a mistake. Same thing with Rebecca, they just lose the game. So by doing that, you should not run into time even when you risk and repeat against a 10 drop Kaido in the late game, and then you win. Mid game 10 drop Kaido is where it's very variable. Early game should never happen because you should not be in three life in the early game. Late game, it doesn't matter. You just win by them dropping the 10 drop Kaido. Mid game is where there's that's where the variabilities will happen. So mid game, and I know I normally min mid game once you're at six or eight dawn, late game once you're past 10 dawn. No, but mid game I'm talking about, you both establish uh, your board and, 
and you're both at low life, it depends right there if you're able to clear, if you have the 15 cards in trash because you're probably using the Luffy's, you're probably uh, using your Bastardos. So for right there and then, it all depends on your trash and your hand when the 10 drop Kaido comes out in the mid game. That's where the variability will lie. And that's where you could find your trouble that you cannot clear the 10 drop because you don't have the 14 cards in trash to activate Bastardo. You don't have a cost reducer. You don't have the, because then, you know, you can also do the Rebecca into Hina, but you don't have the Rebecca uh, because you've been using it and you, you wasted it. You don't have Hina in trash for whatever reason. That's where the Tender of Kaido can become problematic. Uh, but again, the chances of that happening are very, very low. If it happens every game against you against Sagazuki, I don't know what's going on. The sim is bugged then or something. Uh, but in real life, they should not see it every every game in that perfect timing of the mid game. And in early game, you can prevent it. Okay. And how do you prevent it? Just stay at four life. You know, is there going to be games like I've mentioned very early already on this on this rant that you're going to be at three life early game? Yes. You don't have two Ks in your hand. You don't have the blockers out. You can't clear the board, so they're just swarming you. Then there's really nothing you can do. That game is a wipe. It does happen. Same thing against the Sakazuki. There's going to be games that it's a wipe for the Sakazukis. They don't see any Lushis for some other reason. Their Hina's all in their life and you're not attacking their life. So there's also a wipe in the Sakazuki match as well. But in a real back and forth interactive Rebecca versus Sakazuki match, you should be able to hold off at four life. You should be able to clear their board. They should be able to clear you back into back and forth clearing with no life being really uh, removed. And then when they hard focus on life other than clear, it's because they're showing you that they want to go for the 10 drop Kaido. And then you can just over counter to the point that doesn't happen. So you can get to the mid game in your advantage. So when the 10 drop Kaido does come out, you answer it. And then when you answer it, you rinse and repeat, and then you should win the late game. And I hopefully that explains it very well. Uh, because on average, because on the, the reason Rebecca does well against Sakazuki, just in a nutshell, is that you're able to keep your hand without relying on stuff like 10 drop Kaido, and you're able to recur your deck because of Luffy's. And then other than that, so then you're able to recur your Rebecca or Mancherries. The Sakazuki tries to do it with the Lucian and the Mancherry, but once they're answered, it doesn't really happen as effective as Rebecca. So you have a better recurrence, you have better hand power than the Sakazuki, and then you both have better control and then you both control, but the Sakazuki has a little bit better control, but it has less consistency. Well, you have a little bit less better control, but you have more consistency. And that's how I kind of judge them both. So because I like more consistency, this is why Rebecca is better. Because that means in a 10 game back-to-back -back matches, you should see your cards more than the Sakazuki. You can have more unplayable games with the Sakazuki than you can with Rebecca because of that consistency matchup. Can you high roll better with Sakazuki? 100%. But does it happen in every game for 10 games? If you're if you're super, super lucky, by all means. But if not, then no. There's going to be games where you play um, Sakazuki and then you don't see any 2Ks. So then you're just eating 5Ks. You're at no life. What's 10-drop Kaido going to do when you're at no life? And then your opponent can clear your two blockers and then go for game. And you have no, nothing, not even a 1K counter hand. Is that rare? Yeah. Does it happen? I've seen it. Right? So so that's the matchup there. Uh, so you just keep playing consistency, cons consistently. Um, if, like I say, if you're only losing the 10-drop Kaido, then you should be winning most of your Sakazuki matchups, um, if that's your only problem. So but hopefully those tips help you against the 10-drop Kaido in, to prevent the early game. Um, learning against the mid-game 10-drop Kaido, it's gonna be your hardest point. And then late game Tendron Kaido should not be a factor. All right, guys. So that is the Sakazuki matchup, uh, red purple matchup. Purple, I kind of already mentioned, you interact with the board 
and just focus on the Luffy to clear. And then once you know you clear their board and they have no hand, they're they should be at two life on their own, and then you just end the game. Uh, white beer we talked about, yellow we talked about extensively. Um, Zoro and like red green law, I guess, but let's just do Zoro because red green is not a factor. Uh, Zoro should just be a, a easy win. Um, so with Zoro, you just need to know the normal Zoro things. You know, um, Zoro has been losing to Rebecca since OPO4, or well, the way I've been playing it. Um, and in OPO3, just much, I mean, OPO5 is just much easier. Uh, what you do is you focus on the Coliseum and you try to, you don't use a Tendra Kuzan. Tendra Kuzan is a lose in that matchup. I mean, if you play him and you're winning against Zoro, it's because you're so far ahead. So that's not a factor. What you want to have is a lot of 2k counters, Kiruses, Lushis, 4 drop Rebecca, like, and you don't need all these cards, you know, Luffy, 1 drop Coliseum, you know, Bastardos, Three Swords for their Marco, like, Hina, Kobe, like, this is what's going to win you the game. Any of these cards, any combination of these cards, um, are just going to beat the Zoro matchup. There's really nothing they can do. Uh, you don't attack their life at all until you have them at no cards in hand. I'm exaggerating, but basically, they can have no field, no cards in hand, and no matter what they play, I don't care if it's a zero drop, you're clearing everything, and then you just keep blocking uh, their their bigger attacks. You're gonna over counter when you need to. The goal is to stay at least at one life. So when they five drop Luffy you or Diablo Jambi you, you're okay. I like to be at two life against Zoro to be honest now because they have put multiple Diablo Jambes and they have to five drop Luffy. So two life will be the goal so you don't get cheese. But yeah, once you're at two life, you try to over counter, you try to you know, if they're not swinging with 7k, you're countering out no matter what. Even if your hand size become low, because you're going to win in the late game since you're not attacking their life. And if they're whiffing and not recurring their cards with the day and one drop Nami or one drop Buggy, you're, you know, they're slowly going to run out of steam. And then it comes to a point that no matter what they play, you clear with the Luffy or Garp or, you know, Kyrosis. And then you keep blocking when you need to block since they're not gonna attack on blockable every turn. And then you just win the game. There's there's really nothing much the Zora player can do as long as you know how to interact with their board every turn and not how to take life early. So again, going back to that foundation of Rebecca, knowing to activate her ability, knowing how to interact and knowing how to protect. And then the deck would just run on its own to be one of your easiest matchup, Red Zoro. Um, only reason I mentioned Red Zoro is because there has been comments about the Red Zoro. Um, so that is one of your, you know, it's just something that you need to learn how to play against. Once you learn it, you're going to find that it's a, it's a basically a free win. Again, it is a card game. Is there going to be a time that you do lose against Zoro? Yes, but it better be rare. It better be one out of 10 games or one out of a hundred games, you know? It, it shouldn't be, oh yeah, I play against 10 Zoros and I beat five and lost five. No, no. That means you have to keep practicing because statistically speaking, that should not be possible. You know, it's very, very rare. It should be, you know, I'll, I'll accept two losses out of 10 Zoros, you know. That that could happen if you draw all your Luffy's and 10 drop Kuzans in your Mulligan phase. You know what I'm saying? Like, it has to be stuff like that. Okay, um, what else? Sabo. Sabo is one of your hardest matchups because they can, they, they run the rush Sabo version. Uh, what I try to do with Sabo, there we go. This is why I was looking at this guy. Against Sabo, you need to mulligan to see this guy. So, same thing. I did pass the mulligan phase, but yeah, against Sabo, this is what you need. I'm mulligan to see this guy. And once you have this, you use this not on their little guys, but on their big boys. When their nine drop shanks come out, um, because then when you're able to cost reduce it. All right, so this is what you use against Sabo. Um, if you don't have this, you try the Luffy. It's gonna help you because if they protect their body with their Sabo's effect, then you restand and swing again, and then that should answer the the body. 
Um, and I do have a matchup against Rebecca versus Sabo, which can show you why the Luffy is needed in that matchup. And that should be it, guys. So I think I answered all the matchups. I answered the Morgan phase. I answered some strategies, some basic foundation. Um, so I think that's it, guys. I think that should be it. Oh, one more thing about uh, Luffy is remember, if you have no cards in deck, like you're bow deck out, and you, you have Luffy out, but there's nothing to swing at because you have the Coliseum out, but they have no body, and you can't swing your life because you just play the Luffy. Remember, you can play the Luffy, activate Luffy's effect to just bottom deck seven without swinging or restanding him. You're able to do that, so you just remember that so you don't deck out uh, just to deck out. Um, the other thing would be the combos are the same as Sakazuki. You know, four drop Rebecca into a Hina, into a Kobe can pop a, a seven cost or less. Uh, for the Rebecca into a Hina into a Kiros can pop a four cost. You can play Hina from hand into a Kiros or into a Kobe. If you have Garp out, you know, Rebecca into a Hina, you know, basic stuff like that. Another thing just don't remember about her second ability to that you can play Rebecca into a um, into a toy legged soldier because what you do is you grab, say you need to pop a uh, six costs, right? And you don't have a cost reducer, but you have Rebecca and you have the toy soldier in hand. You can play Rebecca and grab Kobe from the trash and use her second effect to play the two legged soldier for free, activate the two legged soldier to minus three, and then play Kobe from hand. That in total should cost you seven Dawn. Um, and then you're able to remove a guy out, have Kobe out, and a blocker out. And so that's why the two legged soldiers also. Um, available to you by using Rebecca's second effect. And of course, the other thing will be grabbing anything you need with playing Rebecca and then using Rebecca's second effect to play the one drop Rebecca to uh, give you a plus one by activating Rebecca's ability because you went even by grabbing a card from the trash with Rebecca, but then you're able to play the one drop Rebecca for free by the Rebecca's ability, able to search. Uh, so don't forget little stuff like that. And, but yeah, other than that, the deck should hopefully uh, be to your guys' standards. I do run nine 2Ks now instead of eight, uh, just because of the red, purple, Luffy. And hopefully you guys, again, hopefully I answer all your guys' questions like I said at the beginning of the video. Hopefully you guys um, learned a lot. And hopefully I explain what I need to explain. Please comment below again for any other questions or any comments or feedback. And... If you need a part two because I need to explain other things that I did not explain in this video, please let me know. I'll be glad to make it. Other than that, guys, thank you guys for watching. And Dave TCG is signing out.